Well, welcome to the second part of this presentation where we're looking at terminology relating to the cardiovascular system. Now, the first section dealt with terminology relating to the heart specifically. We now want to go on to the second part of the cardiovascular system, which is just that, the vascular system. So first of all, we want to look at terminology relating to vessels in general. And then we'll look at terminology relating specifically to arteries and then to veins. So we're starting off with a short section looking at terminology relating to vessels in general. Now angio is the word meaning vessels or pertaining to vessels. And this comes from the Greek angion, the Greek word for vessel. So angio raffi. Now raffi is a surgical term that means to sew up or to suture. So an angiography would be a suturing surgical repair of a blood vessel. So if a blood vessel was injured, a surgeon might sew it up to prevent the hemorrhage. That would be an angiography. Angioma. Now, oma is a lump. Now, angiomas are benign tumours affecting blood vessels. Sometimes they can actually affect lymphatic vessels as well. And these tend to become more common with age, but they can also be a symptom of liver disease. So always consider that as a possibility. And one of the most common types are cherry hemangiomas. Cherry as because they're cherry colour. Hemangioma. These benign tumours in blood vessels. And these are sometimes called Campbell de Morgan spots after the British surgeon Campbell de Morgan who first identified them. But the good thing about them is that they're benign. And geography is where we visualize blood vessels. Now, if you take a plain X-ray, blood vessels are not usually visible because they are soft tissues. So angiography is a technique which allows us to visualize blood vessels. So it's an X-ray technique. And typically a contrast medium will be injected into an area with blood vessels and the contrast medium will be x-ray opaque. So as the medium goes through the vessels, that illuminates the vessels to the x-ray and the vessels can be clearly visualised. So there could be coronary angiography, looking at the coronary arteries, or their pulmonary angiography, looking at the pulmonary vessels, or cerebral and geography, looking at the cerebral vessels perfusing the brain, or extremity and geography, where we might examine the blood vessels in the arms or the legs. For example, if someone had peripheral vascular disease, we might want to do peripheral leg extremity and geography, so we can examine the leg vasculature. Angioplasty refers to widening a blocked or narrowed blood vessel. And this involves passing a, uh, a line, a thin line into the blood vessel. And once the line is in the blood vessel, a balloon around about that line is blown up. And as the balloon blows up, that presses on the inside of the vessel and expands it. And typically, after a balloon angioplasty, a stent will be put in as part of the procedure. So this can be a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, for example. P-T-C-A. Percutaneous means through the skin. Very often the access to this will be through the right radial artery. Transluminal means via the lumen of the blood vessel. Coronary means related to the coronary arteries. And angioplasty is a widening of narrow vessels so there could be a percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. So still thinking about terminology relating to the vascular system and the vessels in general. The prefix vas or vaso means to do with a vessel or a duct. So vascular means to do with the blood vessels. So we might talk about a tissue being highly vascular. So for example, the brain contains a lot of blood vessels or the liver or the kidneys are highly vascular organs. They contain a lot of blood vessels. 
And that's important because if organs like the liver or the kidneys are damaged, they can be a lot of bleeding. They can be torrential hemorrhage because they are very vascular organs. But alternatively, we might say that other tissues are relatively avascular, such as the subcutaneous adipose tissue contains relatively few blood vessels. Therefore, if it's injured, it's less likely to be associated or it won't really be associated with significant hemorrhage. Having said that, there's blood vessels above it in the skin and blood vessels below it in the muscles and other tissues. But the adipose tissue itself is relatively avascular. Cerebrovascular. The cerebro part comes from cerebrum to do with the brain. So cerebrovascular is talking about the blood vessels taking blood to and from the brain. And you might have heard the term cerebrovascular accident. A cerebrovascular accident is where there is some pathology in the cerebral vessels. Normally we're talking about the arterial vessels. So there might be a thrombus followed by embolization from that thrombus, reducing the blood supply to parts of the brain or indeed cutting blood supply to parts of the brain off altogether, resulting in a cerebrovascular accident. Or there could be an aneurysm in a cerebral vessel resulting in a hemorrhage, causing a cerebral hemorrhage. These are pathologies related to the cerebral vasculature. That's why we call them cerebrovascular accidents. Actually, they're not really accidents. They're pathological processes, but that's what we call them. CVAs. Cardiovascular relates to the system of the heart and the blood vessels. It's describing the whole system. So this whole section of videos is about the cardiovascular system and the terminology related to it. Cardio heart, vascular, the blood vessels. Vasospasm. Now, vasospasm, vaso are the blood vessels. Spasm is where the blood vessels close down. The muscular walls in the blood vessels contract and that will greatly reduce the lumen through which blood can travel to perfuse a tissue if there's a vasospasm. So vasospasm can lead to ischemia of a tissue and if the vasospasm is prolonged it can lead to necrosis of a tissue. So this could occur in the heart for example there could be some spasm of the coronary arteries leading to myocardial ischemia. Or there could be a cerebral vasospasm. Now this can occur after subarachnoid hemorrhage, where there is hemorrhage into the subarachnoid space containing the cerebrospinal fluid. There can be a cerebral vasospasm causing a period of unconsciousness. If we inject adrenaline, or that's epinephrine, into a tissue, that will cause fairly profound localised vasospasm. It will close down the blood vessels. This is why when we're giving local anaesthetics, if we're giving local anaesthetics into a digit, into a finger or a toe, we make sure it doesn't contain adrenaline or epinephrine because that will cause a profound vasoconstriction, cutting the blood supply off to that digit because the only way the blood is going to get to a tissue is via the lumen in the vasculature. So carrying on with this prefix vas or vaso, vasodilation refers to widening of the blood vessels. So the vasomotor tone, how constricted or relaxed the smooth muscle in the walls of blood vessels is, is controlled by the vasomotor centre in the brainstem. And if there's reduced stimulation of the blood vessel smooth muscle walls, they'll naturally dilate, there'll be a vasodilation. And that can be good because it will allow more blood to go through to a tissue. Or we might think about the situation where it's warm. If we're in a warm environment, there can be a peripheral vascular vasodilation to allow more warm blood to go to the surface of the body. So this can be an entirely physiological process, maintaining homeostasis and organising the amounts of blood, regulating the amounts of blood that are going through to a particular tissue at a particular time to meet the metabolic requirements of that tissue. 
Vasodilators are usually chemical substances which will bring about vasodilation. So nitric oxide, for example, is a physiological vasodilator. It's released by the vascular endothelium, the cells lining the capillaries and lining the blood vessels. And when that's released, it will cause local vasodilation under the influence of nitric oxide. But we also give vasodilators as therapeutic pharmacological agents. So nitrates, for example, such as glycerine trinitrate, Glycerine trinitrate is a short-acting vasodilator. So glycerine trinitrate will dilate the coronary vessels. That's good because the coronary arterial vasodilation will increase myocardial perfusion, hopefully relieving the symptoms of angina. And glycerine trinitrate will also dilate the larger blood vessels as well, meaning the heart doesn't have to work as hard. Or we might want to lower blood pressure so we can give angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors such as lisinopril that will cause vasodilation thereby lowering peripheral res resistance thereby lowering blood pressure because blood pressure is determined by the cardiac output multiplied by the peripheral resistance so if we lower peripheral resistance we're going to lower blood pressure and that's exactly what uh, ACE inhibitors do the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and other hypotensive agents the uh, think of amlodipine for example the calcium channel blocker amlodipine will also lower blood pressure via this mechanism of vasodilation so very often therapeutically pharmacologically useful and we give uh, vasodilators Vasculitis refers to inflammation of blood vessels. Now this can be infective, there can be infection in blood vessels, but very often vasculitis is what we call an autoimmune disease, where the body's immune system is for some reason attacking its own tissues. It's a pathological process. And this causes blood vessels to swell and narrow. So for example, you might hear, have heard of giant cell or temporal arteritis inflammation of the arteries in the the temporal area at the side of the head causing aching in the temporal area and the patients often complain of um, pain in their masticatory muscles when they're eating or double vision and it can be associated with polymyalgia usually responds quite well to steroids because steroids are going to reduce inflammation but look at the word it's got vas on front on the front, the prefix, the suffix is itis. So we know it's going to be uh, inflammation related to the vascular system. The prefix vaso means that it's to do with the vessels. And the vagal part there on the end, the suffix vagal means to do with the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is the 10th cranial nerve and it's a parasympathetic nerve. So Vasovagal attacks can sometimes be called neurocardiogenic events because the brain triggers off this event. It could be an emotional disturbance, but it, if you're very upset about something or very fearful, or it could be um, a physical thing like standing too long or, or being in the heat. But the brain triggers this, so it's neuro. It's mediated via the vagus nerve, but it's also cardiogenic. Because what the vagus nerve will do is it will, because it's parasympathetic, it will slow the heart rate down. So the person will get a very slow heart rate. And the vagus nerve, because it's parasympathetic, it will override the sympathetic vasoconstricting stimulus of the sympathetic nervous system. And you'll get a vasodilation. So you'll get a bradycardia and a vasodilation at the same time. That means that the heart rate will be reduced, reducing cardiac output. And you'll also reduce peripheral resistance. And both of those factors are going to lower blood pressure significantly. And that means that the brain is not perfused. And if this is bad enough to make you faint, this is called a syncope. A vasovago or a neurocardiogenic syncope. So the person might... Um, well, initially, actually, you often feel very warm because of the vasodilation. Then you tend to feel cold afterwards. 
and you can be very shivery and very sweaty afterwards because of the sympathetic compensation but it's a horrible feeling so do be sympathetic to people that faint because it's uh, it's not a trivial thing for them it, it really feels quite horrible when it happens a vasovagal episode in this next section we want to consider terminology which is specific to the arterial system specific to the arteries an artery being any blood vessel carrying blood away from the heart the english word artery comes from arteria which is the greek word so it comes from classical roots like so many of these words do now if you've got arteria or arterio that's relating to or pertaining to arteries so the al on the end actually means pertaining to so arterial means pertaining to an artery and an artery is simply defined as any vessel which carries blood away from the heart and you might remember that there's the systemic arterial system carrying blood to the body and there's the pulmonary arterial system carrying blood to the lungs now the ol o l e on the end the ol suffix ol means very small or tiny so we've got the prefix arterii on the front a r t e r i arterii on the front but then because we've got an ol on the end that means it's small so this is an artery which is small so an arteriole is a small artery and it's the arterioles that communicate between the very small arteries and the capillaries so the arterioles are the very small ones arteritis is inflammation of the arteries and we dealt with this just recently when we looked at um, vasculitis so i'm not going to do it again here arteriostenosis so arterio, the prefix, means we're talking about the arteries. An osis on the end, osis means a condition of. And the sten part means narrowing. So stenosis means narrowing, an abnormal pathological narrowing of an, arter of an artery. So arteriostenosis is narrowing. Now why might there be a narrowing of the artery and particularly we're thinking about the arterial lumen the inside part of the artery that the blood must pass through well syphilis can be a cause of arteriostenosis it can affect the aorta but more commonly in western countries there can be a build-up of fatty atheromatous plaques inside the arteries so if there's bulky fatty material accumulating inside the artery that means there's less space for the blood to pass through so that can cause an arteriostenosis so this next word is arteriosclerosis now the arterio means it's to do with arteries the osis on the end again means an abnormal or a pathological condition and the scler part means hardening so sclerosis is abnormal hardening a condition of pathological hardening the artery has become sclerosed abnormally hardened and this might occur in arterial disease where there's calcification for example in the wall of the artery making it harder so arteriostenosis is narrowing arteriosclerosis is hardening now arteriole sclerosis can you say this is arteriole sclerosis not arterial sclerosis so this is hardening of the arterioles because it's arteriole sclerosis hardening of the small blood vessels and hardening of the small arterioles is particularly problematic because that means they can no longer smooth out the blood flow and that reduces the quality of the perfusion of the tissues leading to exacerbation of ischemic disorders now the main condition affecting arteries in the western world is atherosclerosis 
Now the athero part means that there is the accumulation of atheroma, this abnormal fatty material inside the arteries. So in atherosclerosis there's atheroma and that is often associated with hardening which is the sclerosis part. Endarterectomy. End or endo means inside. A-R-T-E-R, -E so we know we're talking about an artery. An ectomy means the surgical removal of. So this is cleaning out the inside of an artery. So for example, if someone's getting cerebrovascular ischemia and probable transient ischemic attacks, and they're at risk of thromboembolic cerebrovascular accident, then a carotid endarterectomy may be performed to clean out the inside of the carotid arteries, thereby in improving the perfusion of blood to the brain via the carotid artery. Well, we've talked about an angiogram or angiography, which was blood vessels and the gram part on the end means to make a picture or a recording of. So an arteriogram is, is an x-ray visualization of arteries. So an arteriogram is actually a type of angiogram. So technically you could have an angiogram looking at the arteries or the veins, whereas the arteriogram is specific to the arteries. Now just to finish off this section on terminology relating to the arterial system, aneurysm. Now aneurysm is Greek for dilatation, a widening. So an aneurysm is a weakness in the wall of a blood vessel. And if the wall of the blood vessel is weak, then the pressure of the blood inside can balloon it out, forming uh, an expansion. So aneurysm is a weakness in the wall of the artery, very often giving rise to dilation. There's different types of aneurysm. A fusiform aneurysm tends to have a uniform dilation. But in parts of the body, particularly on the circle of Willis, for example, the circle of arteries at the base of the brain, there can be congenital berry aneurysms, which are berry-shaped aneurysms. And they can have very serious consequences if they're to rupture and to bleed. Now ectasis means a dilation or expansion of. So an artery ectasis is a dilation of an artery. But it's not a term we use very commonly, but that's what it would mean, artery ectasis, abnormal dilation or widening of an artery. Well, this brings us to the last section of our consideration of terminology relating to the cardiovascular system. We looked at terms relating to the heart, terms relating to vessels in general, terms relating to arteries in specific, and now terms relating specifically to the venous system. And a vein is any vessel carrying blood towards the heart. And again, we have systemic veins carrying blood from the body back to the heart, and we have pulmonary veins carrying blood from the lungs back to the heart, the two parts of the venous system. Phlebo or phlebo means to do with veins. Actually, the word phlebo comes from the Greek for blood vessel, but we always use it to relate to veins. So phlebitis is going to be itis, inflammation of the veins, sometimes called a venitis. Phlebitis or venitis or venitis, it would all mean the same thing. But I think phlebitis is the more correct term. Usually a phlebitis would affect the superficial veins with heat, pain, redness and swelling, as you would expect in an inflammatory condition. And there's two types of phlebitis. It can be sterile or it can be infective. And it's important to note the difference. Now, a sterile phlebitis could be caused by us giving certain intravenous fluids, for example, high concentrations of glucose or dextrose. Or some intensive care type drugs have to be given via central veins because they'll cause sterile phlebitis if they're given into superficial veins, purely because the chemical agent in the infusion will cause irritation and inflammation of the, the veins. 
But asterophlebitis can also occur in autoimmune disease such as SLE, systemic lupus, erythematosus, and it can also be a paraneoplastic effect as it might occur with pancreatic, breast or ovarian cancers. But of course, phlebitis can also be infective. Now, this is particularly likely to occur when we have catheters that we leave in patients' veins for prolonged periods of time, more than 48 hours, for example. And the cannulas can become infected, usually with bacteria from the surface of the skin, such as Staphylococcus aureus or Staphylococcus epidermis. And when that's the case, we have to remove it because, because it's the intravascular devices inside a blood vessel it means that the bacteria can potentially spread around the body in the blood so it would have to be removed and replaced if it's still required in an alternative site. Thrombophlebitis would be phlebitis associated with thrombus formation. So if there's disruption to the internal tunica intima, the inner lining of the blood vessel, that can lead to thrombus formation. Now this can occur in superficial veins and if there's thrombophlebitis in superficial veins that's unlikely to cause emboli that are going to go to the lungs. But if it's in a central vein that's very serious because the deep venous thrombosis can embolize leading to pulmonary embolism. But look at the word thrombophlebitis thrombus, an abnormal blood clot or a blood clot in a vessel associated with a phlebitis. Otomy means to make an opening into or to cut into. So phlebotomy is making an opening into a vein as we would do for venipuncture for removing blood samples or for placing an intravenous catheter into a vein there will be a phlebotomy. Phlebosclerosis is hardening of a vein, sometimes called venosclerosis. Sometimes it's called, caused by venofibrosis, where there's um, fibrous tissue developing in the wall of the vein. This can occur as a consequence of long-term inflammation, for example. And it's also sometimes called induration. Induration of a vein is where there's more fibrous tissue, reduced elasticity and general hardness. So phlebosclerosis is a descriptive term. It does describe the condition well, but we actually don't use it very frequently in clinical practice. Osis means pertaining to. So ven, the prefix is to do with veins. Osis is pertaining to. So venous simply means pertaining to veins or the venous system. Venipuncture, as we've just seen, is a phlebotomy taking blood from a vein. We are puncturing the vein to take blood out. Venothromboembolism. This is called VTE. There is a thrombus in the vein that produces emboli. So the thrombus is the abnormal blood clot and the emboli are bits of that that break off and embolize into the venous circulation. So, for example, a deep venous thrombosis can lead to a pulmonary embolism. So DVT and PE, deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, are both under this more umbrella term of VTE, venothromboembolism.